Welcome to the Business of Property podcast. I'm Simon. And I'm Stuart. We talk every week about the reality of running property businesses. Stuart runs a portfolio of co-living properties with a six-figure turnover. And Simon owns buy to lets and created Patma, a leading portfolio management software system and a source of property market insights. Before we get started on our topic today, please do open the show notes and find the link to join our BOP email tribe. Click there and enter your details and we would love to welcome you onto that list and we will be sending out emails there with all sorts of lovely information. Now, our topic for today is all about mortgages. I know, I know, we all often talk about mortgages, but they are so important to property investors. Well, unless you're very, very rich. And we had Simon Glastonbury, our mortgage expert, on a couple of weeks ago, and we timed this very carefully to be just after the Bank of England base rate announcement or change or whatever it was, was going to be. And we thought, this is excellent. Now, now we can have an um, episode with a mortgage update and nothing will change for a while. And then along came the announcement of the latest inflation figures. And as everyone expected, inflation is now lower than it was last month, down to 8.7%, I think. But the trouble is, the markets were expecting inflation to be even lower than that. So this has caused some, some issues in the mortgage markets. And things are now changing again. So we thought we'd talk about that to start with. And, and Stuart, I think you've got some, some figures to, to throw at us related to that. Well, the, f- the first thing I, I thought about was the fact that whenever we hear things are going up, we just think bad. And I think typically that is the right thought, unless it's your bank balance, of course, which, uh, which it very rarely is, certainly in my case anyway. But Obviously, when we talk about the Bank of England rates, the first thing we do is, you know, we just look back and, you know, just to try and get some sense of where things might go, still could go. And the last peak of the Bank of England base rate was before the previous financial crash. And that rate was 5.75%. Now, I just want to cast people's minds back to when this was. So, now, I used to be a smoker, but pre, pre-2005, but for anyone that might remember this, just to take you back there, smoking was banned in the UK. Any ideas when that might have been so? Smoking was banned in public places and pubs. I do remember that, that transition, but I can't remember how long ago it was. I, I would guess it was probably early 2000s. It was the 1st of July 2007 is when that was. Ah, actually later than I thought it was. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And the Bank of England rate on the 5th of July, only four days later. So anyone that remembers that, anyone out there chuffing away at the end of June, (laughs) a few days later, the Bank of England rate went up to 5.75. So we are, as of this release today, at 4.5%. And now common thinking is it it could certainly go up from from there. Uh, So it was 4.5% on 11th of May. And now you and I were talking and thinking, well, your, your prediction for this year was potentially up to five and and that's no no i i I only predicted 4.75 at the at the the highest and i thought it was probably going to stop at 4.5 so so i I was being quite pleased with myself until this this latest kerfuffle around inflation and and now now i think i've i've blown it it's uh, it's probably going to go wrong well the truth is we we just don't know and until until the end of the year we're not going to know but it it certainly feels like given what we're seeing with the the continued inflation and that's going to keep going up so you and i were just talking about what that means and and how that's affecting things and as we all know it's affected mortgage rates and we're seeing those creeping up again they're sort of stabilized but creeping up but the the other point that i just wanted to talk about briefly was the fact that um certainly buy to let mortgage products because this was in the bbc news about the fact that the number of mortgage products had been taken off off the shelves my language not theirs and particularly for buy to let it was that we there were something like 2750 products available but as of the end of may there were 2300 and a bit so you know roughly 400 I worked out about 17% have been taken off. Now, you know, when, again, when you read these headlines, you think, oh, wow, that's, 
you know, things things are changing. But actually, when when I look back at the past, the numbers are still quite high, relatively speaking. It's not that um, the banks are drastically changing things. It's just there are fewer products on the market, and it's, it could be quite a natural thing. Yeah, and I think these, as we saw around the mini budget, the, the first reaction when the companies weren't sure what was going on was just to pull product. So, so you can't do anything just in case it's wrong or bad for them. But then as things stabilize, and they, they took a little while to stabilize around the mini budget, but I think they'll probably stabilize much faster now. I think those products will, will come back to the market. It's, I think it's unlikely to be a, a long-term drop with all those products going away forever. I think it'll probably be just while companies work out what the, the new expectation is and reprice and rework what their offerings are and then they'll they'll be back again so i I don't i don't think it's too doom and gloom really to be honest i I don't put too much store in it unless all of a sudden they say there's there's only five products available with the number of banks and we to be fair we've seen that with utility because of the number of utility providers that had to leave the market because of all the things we know and love because they went bust basically yes (laughs) Yeah, because because they couldn't uh, couldn't afford to subsidise the the costs that they'd sold at. That all of a sudden we were, we did have many fewer products, and actually that was quite an issue for us as consumers and users because all of a sudden we had nowhere to go but to pay these prices. So that so that element is a is obviously a risk, but I think certainly with the number of banks, I, I just think we're, there's always going to be a, a a product that we can use for our businesses. So number of products is less of a concern to me, but I guess the, the bigger concern is the rates we're having to pay for these products. And Simon, you were talking about some of the stress test rates, which again, I don't think about too often because as a specifically HMO portfolio landlords, they tend not to be as much of an issue. But when you mentioned a couple of those stress tests, it, it certainly piqued my interest. Yeah, so the... It, you, there are sort of two two percentage figures that are used in the, the stress test and the rental cover calculations that mortgage companies do for buy-to-lets and, and HMOs and generally property investments. The first one is the, the, the stress rate, the, the rate of interest that they would calculate on your loan as sort of their, their amount of interest going into the rental cover calculation. And it used to be, I don't know, a year or so ago, <laughs> that this would be around the 5% mark. And that was just sort of an arbitrary set figure. But now they've shifted much more to being the amount you're paying for the mortgage plus something. So just looking today on the Mortgage Works website, their figures are currently between plus half a percent and plus 1.5%. So if you're paying a fixed interest rate of 5.5%, say, on your, your mortgage loan, then the stress rate calculation would either be 6% or 7%, depending on which product category you fit into for, for the mortgage rates. And this is just, just one mortgage provider. It's just an example it's just because their, their figures happen to be easily available on the web that I'm, I'm using them. So once you've then taken your mortgage loan, you've calculated the interest based on, on that six or seven percent figure higher than what you're actually paying then they then multiply that up again by either 125 percent if you're a buy to let and lift a company or a personal name buyer but paying lower rate tax or 145 percent if you're buying in personal names and you're a higher rate taxpayer or and this is one i hadn't seen before 170% if you're buying an HMO. And they they do that for limited company or not limited company, apparently. So so it can can multiply up quite a lot. If the interest calculated from their stress rate is, say, £1,000 a month, and they want 125% rental cover, that means the rent you charge has to be, or the rent they think you can get, should I say, has to be at least £1,250. If it was 170%, then it would have to be £1,700 in order to satisfy their, their cover requirements. 
So, so this is all, all fairly standard stuff. It's all been in place for, for a long time. And those particular requirements, I don't think, have changed very much. But obviously, as the pay rate for the mortgage creeps up by half a percent here, half a percent there, then it compounds through the stress rate being higher and then through the, the cover rate on top of that. And, and it, it does magnify these and it really does reduce how much you can actually borrow for a mortgage. And especially if you're looking at sort of 145 or maybe 170% rental cover requirement. And yeah, I, I think as the interest rates creep up, it, it just continues to, to make it unfeasible to get high mortgages for, for rental properties. And it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. But it, I think it was the 170% rental cover that you particularly hadn't seen before. And you, you do tend to buy HMOs, Stuart. So what sort of rental cover requirements have you seen? Well, as I say, to be honest, it's not something I've ever looked at. So I don't think it's ever come up as an issue for, for mine. And I just had a quick, I looked at one of the, so one of the biggest mortgages I've got on, on one of the larger properties, the seven bed, is about £1,200 a month. So even if I look at that as a, if I, if I times that by 170%, it gives me 2000 and, you know, that's, that's easily doable. And so I just think, you know, if, if, I, if I think about some of the most expensive places to run an HMO, and I'm thinking my mind immediately goes to university towns, Cambridge, Oxford, Brighton, you know, those sorts of places uh, where I imagine you're going to pay, you know, three, four, five hundred thousand pounds for a property. I'd, uh, I'd hazard that at 170 percent that should still be highly achievable depending on the on the rate obviously because as soon as you start getting six plus then that's going to become more and more challenging so quick look for me it's it's not a, it's not a huge concern but it is obviously something that that we have to think about and and again I immediately think about in terms of the rental covers we've talked about this before you know the studio flat I've got I think based on current rates and rental covers, we wouldn't get the same loan to value that we've got on the property now. And that is, that's a very real concern, I would imagine, of many landlords in many areas at the moment, which is what happens when the end of the fixed term goes. Well, if you can't afford to remortgage on a better rate, you go on a standard variable rate and that scares the bejesus out of most of us. Certainly does yeah. me. I, I've, I mean, this is not by select, but just on my own home, we we've, we've had to look at a, a remortgage in the last few weeks with the Halifax, and we're just looking at, at staying with them. So it's a simple transition. But the the rate we were looking at as a fix was around four percent, but their standard variable was seven and a half ish percent. I mean, seven and a half percent. I mean, especially versus four as well. I mean, it's just a huge difference, almost double. So yeah, you don't want to be ending up on standard variable rates, my goodness. No, uh, and that's the thing, almost double in terms of percentage points, but probably more than that when it comes to, you know, the, the mortgage payments in real terms as well. But we were, you know, we have titled this episode about how do, how do we make things more predictable for us? And, you know, these are the, the elements that we're talking about now or the parts really which create the variability. So Simon and I were talking about, you know, how, how do we mitigate that? Because the the environment will change. There are things that we can control and things we can't control. Just, I mean, to follow through and just the final thread of what we were just talking about, ultimately where we've got to now is that landlords have two choices. They can either remortgage on a, on a, on a um, yeah, certainly not a remortgage onto a standard variable rate, but they could take a, a worse product, which most people don't want to do if it means they're going to be worse off, particularly you know, all the things we talk about in terms of tax. So other real option is, is sell the property. And, that, and we are seeing that. And just the other stat that uh, I saw in, in the news in the last week was that only a third of the investment properties that are being sold at the moment are going back into the rental market. So that's demonstrating and this is data that comes from Zoopla haven't looked deeply into it so couldn't uh, fact check all of it but as a, as a general element it seems to make sense so it's, it's showing that people are can't buy these properties or won't buy these properties as rental 
And, you know, the first response to that is, well, that's good because surely that's what we and the government wanted was they wanted more people to buy properties. But obviously the flip side of that coin is, is again, there's fewer rental properties to the market. So those that can't buy now aren't able to rent either because there's fewer markets and fewer properties on the market. But those those things aside, I was just thinking, so from my business, what, what do we do? And so for me, with we've got close to 70 rooms, it's all about creating predictability in the business because if I don't know where the business is going to be next week, next month, or in the next six months, I I don't know if the business is going to exist. And that, that simply can't happen. It's very different if you've got one buy to let or maybe a couple of buy to lets. I think that's quite a simple thing. But for me, with almost 70 tenants and, you know, the energy bills and everything else, that combined with the Bank of England rates means we're in an environment where I have to create some predictability just so that we can get through the day to day. Number one, so that the business can exist, but number two, so that I don't have to constantly keep thinking about, oh, what's it going to mean if the rate goes up by a quarter of a percent? So the, the first thing that aligns to what we're talking about, Simon, is probably around the mortgage rate. So for example, when you've got a mortgage coming up in the near future, what, how do you manage this and what do you think about? As you said, there's, if, you're, if, if you're in a buy-to-let world, which, which my investments are, I think it's much simpler than, than in, in your more complex HMO world. And mortgages are almost the only sort of expense that I, I have that I need to, to worry about managing and, and staying consistent. The other expenses I, I have are, are fairly low. There's things like buildings insurance and a few other small bits and bobs plus accountancy, I suppose, for the, for the limited company stuff. And the, the, I don't think there is very much you can do to, to fix sort of insurance costs beyond a year, but you, you can, and generally insurance is only sold on, a, on an annual basis. So that's normally fixed. I have chosen an accounting service, which is also fixed, at least for, for a reasonable period of time. And in the, the mortgage world, I, I choose fixed rates in order to to give me that that certainty and i tend to I, i've always tended to go for slightly longer fixed rates in order to give me a longer certainty period so i go for for five years currently and that, that's what i have done for for a while and i think at the moment where it feels like rates are high it can feel uncomfortable deliberately choosing to fix at that high rate for five years. But I think the certainty of knowing where you're at and what your expenses are going to be, I think outweighs the sort of potential of rates going down, especially when we talk to people like Simon Glastonbury. And he, he says, as a, a sort of someone with industry knowledge, he really doesn't think rates are going to fall very much anytime soon. And if you look at swap rates and things, which are also the, the indicator of sort of five years out market predictions, that they also roughly agree that maybe rates will drop a little bit, but not too dramatically. So, so yeah, I, I, I looked for, to fix for five years and, and it does sort of feel difficult at the moment, but I, I think that is, is the way that, that you can create certainty in your business. Now, for you, Stuart, you, you don't just have mortgages. You have lots of other expenses as well that you you also need to worry about. So how and where do you sort of prioritise trying to fix those things and, and which things can you and can't you, you fix? Well, the truth is now you can, you can fix most things. As you said, I mean, insurance is quite a simple one. Each year you pretty much know what it's going to cost, although that does obviously go up most years. Uh, so mortgages, same as you. I, and it's interesting because the first few years of my investing, all mortgages, I went for two years. And that was because I had the, you know, the refinancing model, the refinancing bug, which, you know, I wish I wasn't so attached to now because I think um, it definitely made things more difficult. But that's a different topic for a different day. Whereas now the last three or four mortgages, I've definitely all gone for five years. And although there is part of me that, being the sort of person that likes to have a little bit of a flutter 
I think, oh, in two years, we really think it's going to be tight. But then I think, well, I just need to be able to build my cash flow models out. So five years is, is a good period of time to do that. And with the HMO properties, we've always been around four and a half, five percent. So it's not too eye watering for me personally. Obviously, when I hear about people that are on you know, tracker rates and they drop down to 2% or, or whatever it is, then I get extremely jealous. But that typically doesn't happen that often. The other areas is utilities. Uh, so I actually use, so there's a number of companies out there that you can use. And I use a company where essentially we fix the energy costs. So gas, electric, water. I actually do the same for broadband, TV license, council tax, I think that's nearly everything. And across all of the, the portfolio, we, we pretty much know what that cost is every month. And we, we can model that out. So they're all fixed and that really helps. Just because they're fixed doesn't mean they don't go up though. So actually, we just ha- even though the energy costs uh, look like from July, they're going to come down again. As always, there's a bit of a lag. So b- because the relief I think it was around, you know, 60 odd pounds that we were getting a month to support us with the energy costs that's been removed. So that means our costs are going to go up a bit and then hopefully they'll come down a bit again later in the year. So that's the only challenge I have is there's more of a lag. If I was dealing directly with energy companies like British Gas or whomever, EDF, I'm sure there would be less of a lag because I would just pay them exactly what they need to pay. However, because I wanted to fix the costs and also, to be honest, get someone else to manage all of that for me, then I kind of I kind of suck that up, really. So they're the two costs, obviously, that I, I kind of just fix so that we can predict it. The, the other areas, and it's the same for all of us, but depending on you know how large the portfolio is, is really how confident are we around the rent rates and how much is coming in. And really, that is you know the bread and butter of anyone of us that, that runs property is understanding what your current contract terms are with existing tenants, who's on periodic, i.e. just running month to month, which rooms are empty, and really keeping an eye on occupancy. So that is a real big focus for me right now to move on to next, which is to make sure, because it's very easy, particularly when you use agents, to sometimes just let a couple of things slip. And before I know it, I might have one or two rooms empty, which on the on the face of it doesn't feel like a huge issue but of course that really affects the profit margin if you know if there is one so again that's that's how we sort of build the predictability and that is about really keeping tabs every month on who is in properties and out of properties so that we can still make sure that we're forecasting the correct amount of revenue in as well as the cost base that's going out Yep. So I think the theme really is is fix what you can <laughs> and and stay on top of and aware of things you can't absolutely fix. And things do keep going up, but hopefully if you stay aware of them, you can stay ahead of them and and make sure that the income balances is those expenses. But for I think it's around twenty percent of the of the mortgage market has to be remortgaged every year. And for for a portion of those, they are going to find in coming back into the current mortgage market, having previously done this two years ago or five years ago, that they, they are faced with some potentially difficult options. And as you said earlier on in the episode, it could be that they cannot get a, a mortgage of the same level that they, they currently have as in the same loan to value. And they, they might be faced with the option of putting money into their property or selling their property or accepting a less favorable rate, May, maybe with the existing lender or maybe still being able to switch, but to a less favorable rate. I think it is going to be difficult for lots of people in the next few months, maybe years, if rates stay high for a while. But as you said, very early on in this episode, it's, it's not that historically unusual, this level of rates interest rates that is so so yeah i think it is something that that we as investors need to to start getting used to and start adapting and starting to get used to to fixing what we can where we can and making our businesses a lot more predictable in in how they run no i agree and that is i think the key 
component of for me running the business is is creating that predictability because we are there are things we can control and there are things we can't control and when things outside of our control like bank of england interest rates mortgage product rates change we are then left to to take the actions where we can and that is choosing the right products that we think for us making the making the best choices and then building out that predictability because i think it's very easy to sort of throw our hands up in the air particularly when we're in the property world like we are and we see all of these ongoing challenges that we have to just say it's it's too much and we can't do it but my personal belief is that i, I would imagine if any, property probably more difficult than most but in any sector there are always going to be challenges there's always going to be new regulation there's always going to be elements that make you feel like you're trying to swim uphill but for me that means we've just got to focus more on the things that we can control and when things don't work change them and uh you know that's what i'm doing i'm actually looking at selling a property for the first time in a while you know but uh that's that's probably for a for a different podcast definitely for another day i think we are we're out of time for today although i, I might just say as you were saying we should we should change things if we want to and i think if we want to try and help rates come down at the moment, the best thing we can do is try and encourage inflation to come down. And inflation isn't, isn't a thing that you can go and sort of change, per se. You have to change other things in order to, to influence the, the mathematical measurement that is inflation. So I, I think the way to do that is for everyone to stop consuming anything. So, so that, that's uh, my suggestion for today. Stop buying everything, and then gradually inflation will come down, and then gradually interest rates will come down, and we'll all be happy. I think that's how it works. We'll see. Do write in. Let me know. What are you fixing? What are you changing? How are you trying to help your business going forwards? And do find that link to join our email list in the show notes. And Stuart and I will look forward to talking to you next week. Bye.